then uh, we will begin this meeting. Uh, this special meeting of the, I'd like to convene the special meeting of the um, San Lorenzo Valley Water District uh, for February 2nd, 2023. Um, Holly, would you take roll, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Ackerman. Director, Director Ackerman notified me that um, she wished to be excused this evening. Um, they had to euthanize their family dog, and Jamie was uh, grieving today. So. Director Falls. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. And if we have to vote for excusing that absence, can we all just yes. raise our hands to do that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Okay. Um, do we have any additions or deletions to the meeting? Um, Holly, since you are representing the district right now? Well, I think that would be Gina. <laughs> no, and she shook her head no, so. Okay, okay, all right. And we do uh, not appear to have any um, participants no members other of than the public us. available, so uh, we can go to closed session the go-to meeting. Okay. Meeting go there. Open that for you. Seeing Jeff. Oh. You're not seeing Jeff? Well, he's not on video yet. Okay. I hear him. <laughs> I didn't see him. His name is there. Okay, there he is. Okay, um, I'd like to convene this meeting uh, again of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for February 2nd, 2023. Um, we have nothing to report uh, in this open session regarding the uh, two closed session items uh, that we discussed. Since we've already taken roll, I think we're covered on that. Is that yeah. right, Gina? Into the agenda, we take roll again when we. Oh, okay. All right. Will you take roll, Holly? President Smalley? Here. Vice President Hill? Here. Director Ackerman is absent and excused. Director Fulce? Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Okay. Um, are there any uh, additions or deletions to the open session items, Rick? Uh, staff has none, Chair. Okay. 
um, oral communications. Uh, this is the portion uh, for anyone from the public to provide comments on items that are not on our agenda this evening. Um, I don't see anybody wishing to comment. So we can proceed. Okay, um, the president's report, I have no, um, no items to report on now. Um, so we will move to unfinished business, the Redwood Park pipeline. Yes, um, I'll ask the, the district engineer to uh, report on this item, Josh. Thanks, Rick. So as has been discussed previously, the district is working to replace the swim tanks and some associated pipeline in the Redwood Park neighborhood. This memo recommends that we award the construction of the pipeline to Casey Construction and provides a, uh, a proposed motion. A little bit of summary, we had four bids ranging from just under 550,000 to just over 675,000. The low bid is Casey Construction. They, for all we've been able to find out in our research, are experienced and capable contractors for this type of work. The work involves constructing new pipeline between the existing swim tank site and the proposed or future swim tank site. With that, I will take questions. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, so we'll start off with uh, Bob, a member of the Engineering Environmental Committee. Um, and to clarify, the committee has not reviewed uh, this or this uh, bid submittal. So, Bob. Yeah, uh, thank you, Josh, for for clarifying. This is in preparation for installing the new tank. Um, that's great, and that. Um, you've done some diligence on Casey Construction. I didn't recognize their name. Um, and what what kind of projects did you find that they had done um, that uh, led you to the conclusion they would be able to execute? Truth be told, I didn't find their name uh, terribly familiar either. I found multiple pipeline projects and one of which was in a similar type of situation, narrow road, a lot of houses, and a variety of other construction work, which while not pipeline work, which is what this is, showed that they seem to be able to execute on projects that require traffic control that can be as complex as that required by Caltrans. And in this, particular situation, the traffic control is going to be a significant issue. So that was something I was looking for. Had they had one of their projects been a Caltrans related project? More than one. More than one. Oh, okay, great. You know, as you know, I'm really excited when I see new names because we need more people bidding on our um, projects. So I'm really happy that you got as many names as, as you got. It, I think we're starting maybe to get the word out that we actually have money that, you know, we want to spend. Um, just a quick calculation, roughly about $400 a lineal foot, um, which given some of the challenges that are going to be there is, I mean, that's probably, I hate to say it's market, but because it's really expensive, but it's market. Um, what about the pipe? Do they have pipe available? No, no one has pipe available. This project will be subject to the same ductile iron pipe material delays as everybody else. We're looking at currently 50 weeks. That's five zero weeks delays, according to Ferguson and according to uh, Core and Maine, who are two of the supply houses I reached out to to check. And is there any kind of concern that perhaps this might go up based on whatever the price is by the time it arrives? There is concern, but we do have two paragraphs in our general conditions, which are part of the RFP for this project. Paragraphs 4.5 and 4.6. 4.5 addresses materials escalation and provides that any change in material price will be honored, but pegged to 
let's see, the index for scrap steel. The idea being that whatever the change percentage wise is in the cost of scrap steel, we will pay that percentage change in the cost of materials. 4.6 refers to cost of labor and should prevailing wage change between now and the time the project actually goes. And the contractor asks us to pay the prevailing wage at the time that the contract is able to be executed, we will pay that prevailing wage. Great, uh, thank you. Good, Gail. Uh, actually, uh, Bob's last question that Josh answered so well was really the only concern that I had, so nothing more. Okay, Jeff. So, going back to the subject of uh, what other types of pipeline projects or similar things they've done, I'm just looking at their list here of experience, and they've done a lot, a lot of pipeline work, from what I can see. A lot of it was sewer rather than fresh water, but uh, they've. I I think you've got a good vendor here. It looks like on paper, at least. Okay. Um. We received four four bids. Mm -hmm. uh, the second bid is uh, within ten percent of the first. So um, I think we're we're comfortable with that. Uh, from a bidding perspective, Josh, on the escalation factors that you mentioned, um, they have the opportunity to do that at the time uh, the contract is issued, you said? It's kind of variable. Okay. When they receive their materials from their suppliers, from okay. Ferguson or from Corin, Maine, they will receive a bill for those materials. Mm -hmm what those materials cost them at that time may not match what they were quoted when they've completed their bids. Okay. Rather than leaving contractors on the hook for that and forcing them to take a wild guess about what costs might be a year from now mm -hmm. and inflating their bids, what our escalation clause 4.5 does is allows them to say, hey, district, we quoted this pipe at I'm going to pick numbers out of the air, mm -hmm. at $10 on right. the near foot. But we got our bill from Ferguson, and it's $12 a linear foot, just for the materials. Right. So will you pay us the extra $2 a linear foot? To which our response will be, let's look at the change in the scrap steel index price. Right. And Good. if that price is a 20% increase, then yes. If that price is a 10% increase, then we'll pay eleven dollars a linear foot. Okay, good, good. Well, um, I'm comfortable uh, with this. Uh, good job on getting that number of bids. So, I'd like to make the motion that we uh, direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Casey Construction for construction activities related to the Redwood Park Pipeline replacement project in conformance with Casey Construction's bid in the amount of $547,601. Second. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, given that, uh, I don't see any members of the public to solicit comments from. Oh, no, there are five people. There are five. Um, oh, okay. Ah, excuse me. Uh, any comments from members of the public? Uh, seeing none. Uh, Holly, will you take a, a roll call vote on this? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Foles? Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Moving on to new business. Uh, the great study request for proposal. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the finance manager will present this item to the board for discussion. 
Kendra. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, so the district completed a rate study back in 2017 that resulted in a five-year rate increase. The 2017 rate study and corresponding five-year water rate schedule are included for review in the links below. While revenues and expenditures are monitored on an annual basis, rate studies are usually done every three to five years, and we had a rate study budgeted in the uh, fiscal year 21 through 23 biennial budget. Uh, part of the rate study would include a cost of service analysis, um, and the last cost of service study that was done in 2016, along with the rate study, um, since then, we've had significant changes in our water system, um, including damage from the CZU fires and our most recent storms, uh, and that warrants an updated cost of service analysis. And uh, basically, a cost of service analysis is to equitably, equitably distribute the revenue requirements between the various customer classes, and it determines the cost differences, if any, um, exist that exists between serving the various customer classes. Attached to this memo is the draft 2023 rate study RFP. This RFP was reviewed at the November 1st and December 6th budget and finance committee meetings, and it was discussed at length with staff and the committee members, and all edits and comments have been included. Uh, the re recommendation is that the Board of Directors review and provide input on the 2023 rate study and cost of service analysis request for proposal and authorize the district to advertise the RFP. Okay. Thank you, Kendra. Um, since this has been uh, reviewed with the Budget and Finance Committee, I'd like to hear from the committee chair on that. Okay. Um, um, Yes, I would just add that um, I think, Kendra, we also uh, discussed it at the January 18th uh, budget and finance meeting. Is that, that's, that, am I right there on that, Jeff? You remember correctly? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So the first draft was prepared by the staff and um, presented to the budget and finance committee on November 1st. Um, we had uh, a number of comments which the staff then um, incorporated into a second draft and that was um, sort of provisionally approved and but then over the end of the year we realized that um, well it was approved one of the uh, members of the uh, committee had dropped out members of the public and then we had two new members of the public join us this year and recognizing that um, this rate study was going to be largely falling on the budget and finance committee moving it forward um, this year. We felt it was important that the new members um, of the committee, all three of the public members, be able to sign off on this. So we took the opportunity to do some uh, more revisions, myself and Jeff, to just uh, update it a little bit in terms of issues having to do with consolidations and CZU fire. Um, and so we again presented it and it was uh, adopted unanimously at the uh, January 18th meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee. So our um, goal tonight is we hope that um, we want the board to take a look at it. Um, if they have any suggestions for changing it, um, we'll consider those or whether, and if there are not, then we would hope that we would get the approval of the board uh, to authorize the district and the district manager to advertise uh, the RFP. Okay. Thank you, Gail. Um, Jeff, any further comments or questions that you have on it? I think Gail covered it quite thoroughly and um, I'm in agreement with her. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bob? Uh, yes. Um, I see that if it's adopted tonight, um, that the RFP responses are due by March 6th. Um, when would the, when is the estimated time that the consultant would start um, their work? Um, they, well, so the proposal would be due March 6th. Um, and we do interviews and negotiations sometime in March. 
um, after the review process. And we'd select the uh, selected consultants at the April 6th board of directors meeting. And then the final selection would go out April 7th. So essentially it would be starting after we select the consultant. So yeah. this is shown on page 61 um, of the agenda tonight, this schedule. The so it's under selection schedule item number seven. Yeah, I appreciate that. Sometimes I ask questions just to make sure that they're on the videotape for the community when they're watching. Uh, so thank you. Um, will this, um, I mean, I wasn't sure about this, but I looked at the uh, last rate study and I was very deeply involved in the district at that time. Um, will this rate study also include a specific uh, five-year operating budget and capital budget for the district so that the community will know exactly where their money is going? Um, yeah, let me find what page that's on. It talks about um, them laying out a five-year and 10-year budget. Uh, See that also. Find that page. If someone finds it before me, feel free to <laughs> speak up. Uh, I, well, I, I concur. Uh, page 58 of the uh, agenda under task 200 revenue requirements and rate schedule, consultant will develop recommended alternatives for a, or, uh, sorry, consultant will conduct a detailed review of the district's operating and capital improvement budgets and one time costs associated with recovery from the CZU wildfire to determine revenue needs over five-year and 10-year horizons. Consultant will develop recommended alternatives for a five-year rate schedule beginning with the fiscal year starting July 1st, 2023. So I just want to make sure I'm really clear about what that means. So um, a couple of years ago, we did a two-year budget um, that uh, one part of it was a um, five-year look ahead. I think that uh, your predecessor did. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what is being envisioned? That we would put together an operating budget and a capital budget that would be looking ahead five years and 10 years at that same level, at least at that same level of detail? Yes. Okay. Um, and given that we are in the middle of uh, contract negotiations, uh, will all of that sort of come together at the same time, do we think? Uh, I mean, depending on when negotiations are finalized, then it would be taken into account in the rate study. Um, in the specific exploration of options, on tiered volumetric rates, the rationale for moving to a flat rate five years ago was that the tiered rates were not, general tier rates were not allowed uh, as part of a, was it, I think it was a San Diego court case, something somewhere in Southern California, and the volumetric rates would only be allowed in circumstances where defined costs could be shown to justify the volumetric rates. How how did that how was that discussion during the budget committee meetings? Let me answer that. Um, I think I would just point out that the, the timing of that court decision, um, I think, colored very much the discussion during the 2017 rate study. But since then, um, I think that there have been other decisions that have shown that it's pretty easy to demonstrate that increased consumption increases your costs because you have to pump, in our case, it would mean we'd have to pump more well water or you have to, um, you know, build new reservoirs or, or bigger pipes. And so the result is, is that everybody around us, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, Soquel, where I used to live, Menlo Park, all have tiered rates and of two, three, or more rates. Mm -hmm. And in some cases also have special rates um, or sort of bulk rates 
to help out schools like the UC Santa Cruz has its own bulk rate um, because it, you know, they have a huge amount and so you can't put them up in the highest tier. So there are ways to deal with that too. So that that's why um, that's that situation has changed. It was just the sort of timing of the 2017 rate study was an in it in opportune time in terms of the legal uh, wrangling over over the issue. And so I think the main reason that we think that going to tiered rates, or there's two reasons, at least in, in my mind, and Jeff, you can jump in as well, is that obviously tiered rates have demonstrated to effectively uh, help hold down consumption. It's the, it's the most effective way to do that. Um, the other is, is that it allows you to establish a lowest tier that, that could be somehow linked to what you believe to be, um, say, for example, a, a number that you often bring up, Bob, that, you know, sort of the fact that our um, indoor usage, you know, is, is less than the California state mandate, is that you could somehow set that lower tier to incorporate those so that people that are of lower income, um, we we can uh, sort of help out that, that that group of people that maybe don't have as as big a properties or they don't have swimming pools or whatever. Um, so it, it's both to sort of um, avoid a situation where you have a flat rate, which in, frankly I think is sort of regressive um, for the, the poorer residents of our valley and also to encourage um, uh, con uh, conservation. Jeff, do you want to answer, respond to that as well? So keep in mind here that we're studying tiered rates. This is a study, and we haven't predetermined that we'll end up with tiered rates. There's, it's just one of the elements of the study. So while I agree with uh, everything Gail said, I, I'm not saying that the, I, I don't believe that including the ability to look at tiered rates in the study necessarily predetermines that we'll end up with tiered rates. We'll see where the study takes us. Well, I mean, I would say the rapid skyrocketing costs of water in our district over the last few years due to rapidly skyrocketing operating costs have effectively done a dampening effect on demand as well. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that works if the objective is to try to maintain some level of revenue neutrality. With respect to the volumetric rates, and what I'm hearing is that the cost would be considered would be the marginal operating costs associated with chemicals and um, uh, if, if chemicals are used and um, power. Um, I mean, our pipes are the pipes. We're not going out and putting new pipes in to accommodate the fact that somebody went from four units to six units um, in their particular neighborhood, at least not yet. Okay, um, the next one was on the shift from, I also wanna make sure people that might be watching this understand that there, the proposal here also calls for um, looking at um, changing the mix of revenue from more variable, which it is now, to more fixed, correct? That's one of, yes, that's one yes. of the elements to explore. Yeah. Uh, Bob, there again, this is not a predetermination of where we'll end up with it. It's, it's, it's a request for them to run the numbers and see what it looks, see what the issue is. Yeah, I understand that, Jeff. I mean, yeah. but there's, there's certainly a, a fair amount of politics that will go into this as well. Yeah. The, the, the last one on the cost of service for the different 37 pressure zones so the implication of that is that depending on which pressure zone you live in, you may in fact pay more for the same amount of water if that kind of recommendation were to be followed. If that type of recommendation were to be followed, yes. Um, there's, there's I, a, I, would, I would just add that again, emphasizing that we're, we're talking about running some different scenarios so that one of the things I hope would be that there would be different ways of, for example, balancing fixed versus variable costs. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea of, you know, it, I think it's worth examining um, the costs that the different zones have. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that you would ever implement anything different. And I, I can just give my own guess is that we probably wouldn't because it would just be too hard to, why would you want to punish people that have lived at high elevations for 25 years? I mean, I just can't imagine personally myself wanting to do that. But what we're trying to do is one of the things that I hope that comes out of this is not simply an exercise that allows us to set rates, but that we actually get some information so that we understand better what our costs are and what's driving um, increases in costs. So I, I see that also, as, that's a benefit of this. And so that's why some of these things are sort of hypothetical and mm. we are like when I just said, probably unlikely to do, but it's worth knowing. Well, it, it sounds to me, Gail, like what I'm, I think what I'm hearing through all this is really asking the consultant that we hire to build a fairly robust financial model for the um, district in, in sort of an, an analogous fashion to what the, I forget the consultant's name, did for the water system itself, the infrastructure itself. Yeah, so that the, the, the objective, yeah. yeah, the objective at the end of this would be to have a sophisticated model for engineering and operations and an equally sophisticated model for financing. So that when, let's say you decided you wanted to make a change in some element of the cost structure, um, you'd be able to put that percentage in and it would have a ripple effect for the model. The model could be extended out a number of years to match whatever it is that you need to do for planning purposes. And it would also include um, the ability to layer in um, capital um, projects, both for debt service as well as for um, capital projects that are funded out of operating and non-operating margins for, for the year. I think that would be a really beneficial thing. And if that is what is actually being requested here, um, you know, that, that's definitely a worthwhile uh, objective. Oh, I think you've stated what I'm hoping will be one of the outcomes. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we guarantee that is one of the outcomes? So, so the bid request does specify that they will build a model for us. Um, okay. It probably isn't specified as in as great detail as we might like, but it does specify that they will build a model for us and it will be available, uh, you know, for us to uh, use on a continuing basis. So, um, and I don't think any of us knew exactly what we had to, you know, what, what had to go into that model, but. Well, having built a model, a financial model for the district, a fairly rudimentary one, but, but still a model, I, I can, I can tell you, it shouldn't be particularly difficult for them to do that, um, particularly people that are used to building models mm -hmm. and do it for a living. Um, and I'm hopeful that we do get things that allow us to have percentage changes around uh, compensation or power costs or what have you so that we can get a better handle on operating costs. One of the things that struck me about the previous rate study was the fact that they were assuming a 2.6% increase in op operating expenses over the course of the five years, which, I mean, I have to, had to smile when I read that because, you know, my target number in the, in the discussions that we'd had previously was about 1.75 times inflation, which during that time was about 2%, um, which, would, which would give you somewhere around 3.5%. Our actual increase is somewhere around uh, six to seven percent, and um, I think it's going to be incumbent upon us that if we're going to put together models that show rapidly increasing operating expenses, um, that we also are equally transparent with the community in these models about what that means for rates, and all of the elements in the cost structure that feed into that have to be equally transparent around that as well. Uh, because a 7% increase in rates per year, or excuse me, in cost per year is roughly going to be around 6 to 6.5% 6 in rates a year just to maintain your margin in order to maintain your infrastructure through either debt or capital uh, projects um, in that year. And that also then gets so, into um, a situation where you're doubling Bob? your rates about every 10 years. 
Bob. Um, do you have further questions on the? Mark, I, I'm perfectly. Yeah. This is a this is agenda item that has to do with building, I, uh, with the rate study and models. I, I am perfectly free I, to comment on that and what should be in here. Right, and I'm trying to get to. We have questions on this um, RFP that's been oh, developed, and so, I, so, I think so you're. With, with all, I think with you're all trending that, back to. With all of that that previous. I said, excuse me, with all that that I said, what I want to do is figure out how do we guarantee that we're going to get that kind of a financial model? Mm -hmm. out of this? And I. Well, I, I think uh, let's, Bob, how about if I understand what you're getting at? And I would be happy to entertain you providing. Uh, the budget and finance committee through through me, um, you know, a, a sentence or two under task 200 or under the um, final rate study report that addresses what you're concerned about. Because we do, as Jeff says at the end, we do have something about wanting a model, but it isn't it, it isn't as specific as as you obviously want. And so, I mean, I'm I'm happy. To do that, if you, because, because as I say, I share I share your desire to be able to use a model um, to change things and figure out how that affects rates. From a uh, thank you, Gail. I, I would be happy to do that. From a process point of view, um, is there, you know, if this was something that was going to be sort of managed through the process, that's one thing. But if we want to put it in the RFP. Is this, do we have the opportunity to do that? Because I don't have that two or three sentences right now today. No, I guess what I what I would propose then, Bob, is that um, that we approve going ahead with this, um, with the stipulation that I would make these minor changes to add one or two sentences that you provide to this effect. In fact, I will make that motion right now <laughs> um, to speed sure. things along. Okay, fair enough. They may be long sentences, but uh, they'll be sentences. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll second that. Did, thank you. Uh, and the to clarify the the motion is to um, accept these amendments and issue this RFP, Gail. Is that yes? So uh, yes, and we would. Um, that making the change, the changes of adding it, one or two sentences that Bob provides about models, and then forwarding it on to the district manager with the authorization that he uh, advertised the RFP. Okay. okay. And we will try to do that expeditiously because we would like to keep uh, with this March sixth deadline, right? Is um, is Monday early uh, okay? Yeah, but no later than that, okay? Because we need to move it along. No, I understand. I'll take care yeah. of it over the. No, weekend. no, I know. I know you're still a working man, so yes, Monday is fine with me. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rick, I, I am I muted now? I, I, you know, these models, whatever models we put in the RFP. We have to be able to mine the information, and that information needs to be available. Um, you know, like when we did the engineering models and so forth, it took a large amount of time uh, to to get that information. I just want to be sure whatever we ask the consultant to do, that information is readily available and doesn't take a year to to mine. I'm sure it will. Okay. Um, I do see in the uh, discussion of the RFP, it references the uh, CZU uh, recovery costs. Rick, will we be able to update um, existing, all of the existing costs we've had for CZU, and then also all of the forward looking ones also, so that we have a more complete that you were, I think you were alluding to in the in the RFP. You know, we we will be able to you know give some uh, good estimations. Uh, you know, there's still some unknowns that may be uh, a large cost, and that's the I, replacement 
of uh, understand that of the cross country pipelines, but the rest right. and the lion the lion slide those are are could be substantial but, costs to the district. But, but we'll do what we can. To but we will update the costs then. Yes. Okay. All right, Bob. Hold, hold, hold a sec. Um, so are we talking about operating costs here or capital? Because we already have a $5 million surcharge for CZU recovery. So what is it that we're talking about with respect to cost? Because operating costs were skyrocketing before the fire and the pandemic. I was speaking about capital costs because it is alluding in there to the CZU recovery costs. Well, but again, this is where we have to be really careful about how we're communicating because the capital costs are in a different bucket than your operating costs and your capital mm -hmm. costs supposedly have already been handled by both the FEMA 90% and the $5 million surcharge. It's already been levied against our uh, community. Now, if we're saying that we have additional cost, capital costs associated with that, that make, needs to make that CZU recovery go up, then that's a separate thing to my point of view than a regular rate study to deal with our ongoing um, uh, capital and operational needs. I, I'm not clear at all as to what the increase in operating costs are associated with the CZU fire recovery. There were, very well may be even at this point, but I believe they're mostly capital. Let me just jump in here and say, I don't think we want to get in the weeds here. My, I, The whole section on impacts of CZU wildfire is to just provide some context. And so if we need to update any of these numbers of what we think the damages are, um, you know, I think we have a, an estimated cost of about 50 million and that's a capital cost. If that's now 60, we can change that. But otherwise, there shouldn't be anything in here that has to do with operation, operational costs. Um, you know, I can also add a line in here that says after the floods of the winter of, you know, of January uh, 2023, we now have estimated uh, capital repair costs of Four million, right? But the, it, but none yeah. of these. This is all just context for them to know what the state of basically the state of the district, and we would only be referring to capital costs, not anything having to do with operations. I, I, I think okay. the problem with that is, is that the way it's written makes it sound like there are costs associated with running the district that require the rate increase, and the fact that we've already done a surcharge, and then we put in oh the justification for the rate increase is CZU fire. That that is a mixed message to the community, and I, I don't think that's the message that we want to send. Okay, thank you for that comment, Bob. Um, well, we do have a motion on the table in front of us. Uh, we do have to ask the public, and I think Alina has been right. I'm going out to the public right now, Sorry. but just wanted to make note that we do have a motion. Uh, comments from the public, uh, Alina Lang. Sorry, I, I just bumped that. It was in my pocket. Apologies. But thanks. Great discussion tonight. Okay. So that's your comment. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, Jim Mosier. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, yes, I also appreciate this discussion. And uh, I'm on the Budget and Finance Committee. I'm the new member, one of the new two members. We did discuss these issues. I want to uh, kind of um, reaffirm what Gail said, which is that uh, the legal decision that was made right before the last rate study has had a lot of, uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion and um, uh, analysis of it and many, many districts across the state now have tiered rates based on a variety of strategies for showing how uh, there are ways in which people who use more water should be paying more. Um, and the rate study structure that has been uh, developed by the staff and approved by the committee is actually quite typical of what's going on around the state. I, I'm a little confused about uh, the 
back and forth between Gail and Bob about these one or two sentences that are going to be added. And I wondered if there could just be a little more clarification about that. Um, I, I just didn't follow the discussion very well. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, from what I understood both Bob and Gail saying was that it was to further clarify uh, details around the model um, and that that's the verbiage that Bob wanted to offer in that and it, Gail had agreed to incorporate that since the definition on the model was uh, less than what Bob was seeking. Okay. Any other uh, comments from the public? Uh, if not, um, there's uh, there is one uh, mark. Oh, okay. Oh, I do see it now. Uh, Cynthia Denzel. Good evening. I just wanted to clarify. Um, it seems unreasonable to me to believe that we are taking on all these new capital projects and there will be no new administrative or operating expenses associated with them unless all of those um, administrative expenses are included in the bids. In other words, are we assuming that all of the contractors that are doing this work will be providing all of the um, support, uh, you know, staff, uh, responsibilities that are associated with this type of project. Thank you. Okay, Rick, you wanna address that? Well, the, the majority of them will be by the contractor and then the support staff that will be working will be charged to the capital as well. Now the accounting and uh, the keeping track of all the billing and, and Accounts payable, accounts receivable. I don't believe that that will be absorbed in operating costs. Am, am I correct there, Kendra? Or do you charge your time back to the project? Uh, so we can only capitalize, um, like let's say Josh or was working on the project providing engineering services or our field crew were actually providing labor in the construction of the project. As far as administrative costs, um, we cannot capitalize those. Those are going to be expense. So, you know, all of our administrative costs for submitting to FEMA and all of that, uh, those get um, expensed. Okay. Thank you. Bob, quick comment. Well, just a quick follow up on what Kendra asked. Are any of those administrative costs associated with the recovery also reimbursable by FEMA? FEMA has one, um, they call it category Z, where there are we are able to um, charge whatever labor costs that we do um, spend on uh, submitting things to FEMA and preparing things for FEMA, but I, I don't know exactly what the cost share is on that. Um, so I'd have to check that. And there is a threshold to the amount that we are reimbursed. Great, thank you. Yeah, and on Jim's comment on the uh, financial model, it, it's basically to, in, in my view, uh, help the district more transparently communicate to, the, to our community when it comes time for the Prop 218. Um, why their rates are going up, what it is going for, and why. Because the last time we did this um, in, a, in a substantive way resulted in 2,400 no votes, which was the most ever, and an enormous amount of community dissatisfaction around this. I would really very much like to avoid all of that. Okay. Uh, we have a motion in front of us, um, and we need to take a vote on that. Holly?
President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, moving on then. Item 11B, the district manager succession planning. Rick. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, the current district manager employment contract will, will expire in August 2024. And, the, and I have uh, indicated uh, the intent to retire. To facilitate a smooth transition, the board desires to develop a comprehensive process for the district manager succession planning, recruitment, and selection process. Uh, to facilitate uh, this process, it's recommended that the board establish an ad hoc committee and appoint two board members uh, to this committee. Um, later, on, I'll ask Gina if she would like to explain more on an ad hoc committee, but an ad hoc committee is generally understood to be temporary. The full board of directors would establish an ad hoc committee to perform a specific task, which in this case would be the district manager succession plan, which will include developing a process to be approved and followed by the full board in connection with selecting a new district manager. Uh, the Brown Act does not apply to an ad hoc committee consisting solely of less than a quorum of the legislative body, provided that they are composed solely of members of the legislative body and provided that these, uh, that, the, that these ad hoc committees do not have some continuing subject matter jurisdiction and do not have a meeting schedule fixed by formal action of a legislative body. Thus, an, uh, an ad hoc committee generally serves on a limited or single purse, uh, purpose. Uh, the committee is not perpetual and is dissolved when the specific task is completed, which would be hiring a new district manager. Uh, the task of the ad hoc committee would be at a minimum to prepare drafts of uh, the following uh, subjects uh, for the approval of the full board. And that would be to develop a draft succession plan and recruitment process for selecting a new district manager. To, review, to be reviewed and approved by the full board, uh, prepare a draft request for proposal for, for a professional recruitment consultant for the position of the district manager, and then the last, any additional tasks related to the specific task of uh, the replacement of the district uh, manager as directed by the board. And if district council would like to talk more on uh, ad hoc committee, um, I would turn it over to her. Uh, well, I, I think you covered it pretty well, Rick. So the only thing I would add is that the resolution does put a one-year um, time frame on the ad hoc committee in order to ensure that it remains an ad hoc committee. So um, the, the committee will uh, dissolve after one year if it's not dissolved before then by a, an act of the board. Thank you. And the recommendation would be for the board to ad adopt the ATAP Attached resolution establishing an ad hoc committee for succession planning with a position of district manager. And additionally, if the resolution is adapt, uh, adopted, to appoint two board of directors uh, by uh, motion. Okay. Thank you for that. Rick, um, point of clarification for me at this point um, do we talk about this? Um, ad hoc committee first, and then talk about uh, the two individuals, Gina, or do I do, can we do those concurrently? It can be done concurrently um, okay. for purposes of taking action. Um, you know, you, you could have a motion that both adopts the resolution and appoints the two board members, or you could do two separate motions either way. Okay. All right. Then um, I would like to cover these uh, concurrently. Um, and I would like to uh, propose that uh, Director Hill and Director Ackerman, uh, two members of the administration committee, um, be the ad hoc committee to address this. Uh, Director Ackerman is not available this evening, but I do have her. Uh, concurrence prior to this meeting that yes, she would uh, agree to do that. Um, as such, uh, let's hear from the board and let's go with Jeff. So 
I would be happy and honored to uh, take on this responsibility. Um, you know, personally, I have hired numerous people over the years, and uh, uh, I think generally been very successful with my hires. But uh, anyway, I think this is the right way to go with it: is to have a have a committee develop a process, get the board to approve the process, and then implement it. So, okay. Thank you, Jeff, for that succinct discussion. Uh, Gail? Um, I, I think this is a good plan. I just um, am wondering whether, um, what the timeline we're kind of considering um, on doing this. In other words, would uh, Director Hill and Ackerman start on this right away with the idea that they would have a recommendation within a month or two, and then we start to advertise or um, I, I just like to, to know and um, because partly because I'm concerned that it could take um, quite a while to find somebody in this labor market. And so I wanna just get a sense for what the expectation is. My expectation would be that they would start immediately um, on this process and keep it moving at board level um, and not to um, take a, uh, take any real time in between steps that I think we should move on it uh, and hopefully we can put together a timeline and a six to 12 month process depending uh, on how it moves you know and we got to have a put together an RFP we have you know there's a lot of board inter there'll be a lot of board interaction uh, on this process um, and uh, I would imagine it will take six to, to 12 months, but that's one of the first uh, um, objectives that the, the ad hoc committee would do is try to put together a somewhat of a schedule for staff. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, okay. I'm hope, my hope is, is that we can have um, a, a fair amount of overlap <laughs> between um, having a new person on board and, and Rick's uh, so that we can, have a mind meld of some sort to all the knowledge that he's acquired over the um, decades of work here can be transferred. And that'll be part of the succession planning, trying to figure out, you know, and again, it depends on who you select uh, and, 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 you know, what their knowledge is of the district and so forth. Okay. Thank you for that. Gail, uh, Bob, questions, comments? Yeah, just from a process point of view, is the intent then that the ad hoc committee would go off and draft um, this proposed process, or would the board provide input or thoughts or topics that they'd like to see covered? Um, and then the ad hoc committee would, would work. I'm just curious how we might go about doing that. Um, it's my thought that the, uh, the ad hoc committee would develop the draft, um, and then bring that to the full board for review and comment, um, similar to other drafts that we've seen like this, um, having something for us to look at first, um, and let them begin to put some, uh, you know, framework straw man framework around it for us to be able to review. Uh, Jeff, do you have a different thought on that? Um, no, I, I think it's it's definitely important that we, we build sort of a structure first and then have a, something specific to discuss. And, and that doesn't mean we don't want to have input from other directors uh, early on in the process, but I don't think we want to take time at board meetings to discuss um, in great detail, the process of this until we've put together something specific to, to talk about. And, and I expect that uh, there would be frequent check-ins with the full board uh, yes. during the process of, of yes. developing. Okay, all right, Bob. I might, I might, um, I might only suggest that um, the ad hoc, hoc committee may take a look at the process that was used uh, last time that we had this situation back in uh, 2014 um, and um, 
maybe not do the same thing. <laughs> so, um, or at least do it in a different way. Um, but I think I think some of that might be instructive uh, to take a look at. And I think certainly Rick might have some uh, views on what maybe worked back then, what didn't, that would be great input for the ad hoc committee. We will have to start with some information gathering. And Bob, in your case, since you have been uh, apparently we're there at that time. Uh, we probably will. We'll send some queries to you and ask for some input. Mm, Brown Act violation. I think we have to be very careful about that. Yes, we will be very careful, but <laughs> but we will ask for some input. Okay. Um, then uh, before I go off to the public, um, I would like to uh, have a motion in front of us then. Um, uh, we adopt the uh, attached resolution um, forming the ad hoc committee uh, to develop the district manager succession planning and recruiting uh, process with the two directors that we've mentioned, uh, Director Hill and Director Ackerman. I second that. Okay, thank you. Uh, comments from the public. I see none at this point. So, uh, Holly, given that, will you take a vote? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, moving on then. Item 11C, the Lion and Big Steel Pipeline. A bit of word for that. Yes, and uh, this is a major project. I'll ask the, the district engineer to present this to the board. Thanks, Rick. As Rick mentioned, this is a major project. This is all new piping connecting our Lion and Big Steel, <clears throat> excuse me, treatment facility and downtown Boulder Creek. We are making improvements to the hub line where it crosses the San Lorenzo River near the Irwin Way Bridge and making some changes in the way the system operates moving certain areas from one zone to another to improve service. And if everything works out according to the calculations, possibly even reducing the number of zones in the district, which is something that I would dearly love to see because anything we can do to reduce our, our exposure in terms of operations and maintenance and simply materials costs is a good thing. So this project has been in the works for several years and we finally got it out to bid. It's closed last week on January 26th. The low bid was from Monterey Peninsula Engineering and it's sort of hard to describe it as low because it is six million two hundred and thirty three thousand dollars. But the eight bids that we received ranged from there up to a high of roughly eight point two million. The second low to address what uh, I believe President Smalley will be looking at is well within that ten percent range, being less than one percent different that was from Granite Rock. With that, I will cheerfully take questions. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so uh, another pipeline construction project. Great. Uh, Josh, I hope that you're compiling the metrics uh, into a database uh, of pipeline uh, lineal per foot costs that we've been experiencing. Uh, that is valuable, not only to us, but to uh, other bid teams out there. And I think we've got a, a, a good database now. So uh, with that, 
Uh, let me go out to uh, questions then. Uh, Jeff? I don't have any at the moment. Okay. Gail? Yeah, I, I just will note that the first two are essentially trivially different in cost. And so um, I was just wondering how you arrived um, at the recommendation for Monterey Peninsula Engineering. I mean, I, I know of Granite Rock. I know we do a lot of work with them. And it, this is a big project. So I just want to make sure that you're confident that Monterey Peninsula, you know, has the same kind of capacity that we know Granite Rock has. That's an excellent question. I did consider relative uh, capability of the two companies. While Granite Rock is the larger firm, Monterey Peninsula Engineering has successfully completed multiple projects in this range, both cost-wise and scope-wise. They recently completed a project for us at the Glen Arbor Bridge, the new crossing there. So we have very recent experience with them. We also have very recent experience with Granite Rock on Quail Hollow. I, uh, I will say that the the project managers from each company that we had on those two projects were very different, and I felt that assuming the cost was the same, that Monterey Peninsula Engineering was a firm which was more interested in making sure the district got what we wanted than Granite Rock was. And I will confess that is a totally subjective judgment based on my experience with each company with one project each. But given that Monterey Peninsula was low and that I had that personal takeaway, I felt that they should be awarded this project. Well, that, that's very helpful. And I think given that we've had success with Monterey um, and you know your subjective judgment matters to me as well. So so that that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Rick, you wanted to comment? Yeah, just Monterey Peninsula also a few years back it completed the North South Intertie and pump stations uh, for the district, a similar project in a high dollar amount, and was very successful in that project. And it's pretty much a lot of the same folks that we're dealing with on, on this project. So we have a, a long history with MPE. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Bob? Yeah, they've MPs popped up quite a number of times. Again, Josh, you know, the number of people that bid on here is is really great. Uh, cost per foot, approximately $520. So um, larger pipe. Um, and I think a lot of this is going to be, well, maybe not a lot, but some major portion of it's going to be in a state highway, correct? Correct. We will uh, be working that, in both Highway 236 and Highway 9. Yeah, so that I mean that that right there, you have to deal with all the you know Caltrans uh, stuff. Um, just for grins, I went back and looked at the original estimate from the um, original certificate of participation resolution that we did, which I think still needs to get updated uh, for a project that was dropped, and that was three point five million. So I was disappointed that we are three million over. However, we were 2.5 million under on Quail Hollow. So, you know, we're almost even for the for all the projects as a whole. As I think I mentioned back then in Quail Hollow, you win some and you lose some. And I wish Granite had been a lot more um, aggressive on this. I'm sure they're kicking themselves right now for being percent off. Um, I had one other question. Uh, what is the current size and age of the pipe that's being replaced? It varies. I, the largest of the pipes being replaced are six inch, and uh, that's mostly in the Lion Zone, down to some areas of two inch in Boulder Creek, where we are taking advantage of rerouting some of our major transmission lines to be able to simply use those transmission lines as distribution. And age varies wildly. From a hundred years to maybe less. <laughs> if it's from, two inch, some of that might be might be a cast, right? From I would 
to hesitate to put a number on it, but certainly older than I am yes. to, I think the most recent pipe that we would be replacing is, Rick can answer better than I, but probably 20 or 25 years old. I think the other thing that's important for, for me anyway, is that I think this is also part of the water superhighway that we were trying to create from north all the way to south. Making, Correct. Um, right, making the, the ability for the district when ultimately we get through the environmental impact process for our water rights to be able to operate the district as a unified entity water source to any destination with no restrictions. And that will allow us to operate much more efficiently. And geez, you know, Josh, if you can get rid of some pressure zones at the same time, that's just a big bonus. I mean, I didn't realize that was a possibility, but yeah, please do <laughs> if you possibly can. I'm sure that our water master plan was a big help, correct? It was. And so huge that we were able to do that and do it in time to be able to uh, assist with this uh, process. So really good work, Josh. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I see that uh, uh, James Furtado has his hand up from staff. Uh, James, did you wanna? Yeah, I just wanted to say that from the original uh, engineer's estimate on this project, um, the project did change a lot through review of plans as we kept finding things from our mapping to what the project was that were indifferent. And so it expanded and that's what really drove the cost of this pr project to go up from the 3.5. Okay. I appreciate Thank your you clarification, that, Josh. At a, at a macro level, board level borrowing money, I'm still focused on making sure we stay to that 14.5 million. And Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't some of this work covered by uh, um, CZU fire damage up by the reservoir and so forth? Correct. There is a stretch of pipe running from Big Steel Tank down to 236, and I believe also a small portion of the Lion Zone pipeline on Payone that will be covered by FEMA 90%. 90%. It's a small percentage of the overall project, but it's it's there. It might get us closer to 2.5 million so that we can be in total sync. Excellent. Entirely okay. possible. Okay. Um, I'd like to make the motion then that we direct so, the district manager. Mark, I have one, one quick question here. Oh, okay. So we're, we're talking $6.2 million here. Um, when do we anticipate that we're going to need to pay that money? And where is the money currently that will be used to pay that? The costs we will start to incur will be, I would anticipate, about a year out because this is another ductile iron pipe project. Mm -hmm. So significant costs will be when materials start to come in and the project, the contractor wants to mobilize. Okay. So, you know, spring of 24, cool. possibly winter. Prior to that, as for where that money is, I will defer to Rick. Yeah, so this, that's part of the loan money, um, Jeff, and this will be money that we're in the process of reinvesting in yes. interest, and um, we've accounted for that in that investment uh, schedule. Okay, that's what I was looking for. I mean, we, we have a resolution that says that 14.5 million will cover this, is to be applied to this project. So we better not be doing anything other than that. That's yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to make the motion that we direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Monterey Peninsula Engineering uh, for construction activities related to the Lion and Big Steel Zone Pipeline Improvements projects in conformance with MPE's bid in the amount of uh, six million two hundred thirty-three thousand one hundred dollars. I'll second that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me see if we have any comments from members of the public on this. I see none. So, Holly, would you take a roll call vote on this? President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Foles. Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Motion passes. 
Okay. Um, moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, does anybody want to pull the items that are on the consent agenda for any comments? Seeing none, um, that is approved. Uh, district reports, um, the district manager's report, Rick. I'll give a, a quick update. Uh, we're happy to report that the district is uh, currently on 100% surface water from our far north reaches of Boulder Creek to our far south reaches of Scotts Valley. Um, and, and that water is predominantly coming from our Foreman Creek, which we put right back in right after the CZU and from uh, our Pelton uh, Diversion Fall Creek. Um, and there is still a lot of water out there, but we are happy to uh, uh, be on 100% uh, surface water. And we also received another $100,000 grant for meter replacement. Um, but that will be coming uh, your way shortly for final approval. So we're, we're happy on both of those items. Good. Thank you, Rick. Bob? And Rick, just to clarify something on the surface, 100% surface water, our south system typically is on well water, but we are able to supply them with surface water due to the emergency situation, correct? Right. We are still in an emergency situation from CZU. Um, uh, and but hopefully soon, as part of the EIR process for conjunctive use, the inner ties will be um, approved for day-to-day -day use. From, from your lips to God's ears, soon. <laughs> yes. Um, right. Soon is a matter of perspective. <laughs> okay. Um, permit status reports. I see that we have one from the. Um, Operation staff, uh, do we have any questions on that? Jeff? No. Gail? Bob? Uh, Rick answered the question I was going to ask him. So there we go. Okay. I don't have any questions either. Uh, committee reports? Any questions on those from the board? I am, um, I, Mark, sorry. Good. Um, it looks like we're going to uh, move our money into a higher return, um, uh, or at least looking at that. Is that what I understood from your report, Rick, and, and from this budget finance committee? Yeah, I can give you a quick answer. We are working on that. Uh, we, the budget and finance committee reviewed uh, the district manager's request uh, to move uh, our loan money out of the county of Santa Cruz, uh, very low interest, and uh, look at moving. We have a lot of hoops to jump through, and we are moving and working on that daily right now to hopefully get that uh, completed very shortly. But yes. I, I mean, for perspective, the county of Santa Cruz was offering a decent rate of return when interest rates were in the uh, much, much lower than they are now and at a risk-free rate. What we're, what we're seeing is with the increased interest rates, there's more opportunities, I think, to invest the funds, right? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see anything else um, on the no written communications, no informal materials, um, and we do not need to um, re-adjourn to the closed session. So without objections, I think we can adjourn. Good night, everybody. Okay. Yep. Good night. Thanks, That's folks. 746 adjournment, and um, we do not, no longer need to have anybody come back. So we're all set, and good night. Good night, Holly. <laughs>